Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us for this AIA contract documents webinar titled, When Disaster Strikes, How Do AIA Contract Documents Address COVID-19 Issues? Uh, over the last few weeks, um, we've been hearing and you've been experiencing a number of disruptions to your projects. Uh, things like work stoppages, uh, materials that are delayed and being delivered or very difficult to get at all. Um, and we're going to be talking about some of those issues over the next uh, hour and a half or so uh, of this webinar. We're going to be particularly talking about them in the context of two AIA contract documents. Uh, first, the A201 general conditions of the construction contract, uh, and, and then Second, we're going to be talking about some architecture and architect-related issues uh, in the B101 Owner Architect Agreement. So if you're following along and you're listening to this at the very beginning and you're particularly focused or interested in the issues that architects are going to run into, we're going to be addressing those towards the back 30 minutes or so of this webinar. It is scheduled for 90 minutes. Um, and, and so we're going to be focusing first on owner contractor issues some of the more common things people are um, experiencing like uh, work stoppages delays owners looking to suspend their projects uh, so we've we've arranged this presentation and we think in kind of the most common things you're facing uh, right now uh, but we also want to hear from you uh, we have um, you know if you have questions for us please send them in to us we'll do our best to try and address those throughout the presentation uh, and and if we can't do, uh, answer them during the presentation, we might do some kind of a follow up uh, afterwards. Uh, also, one other uh, kind of housekeeping thing before we get going into substantive materials, um, we did give a very similar presentation on Friday af uh, Friday afternoon of, of just of last week. So if you're joining us on this one, expecting uh, a lot of new content, it's there will be some new. Uh, wrinkles in here to this presentation, but it's largely the same material that we covered on Friday. We just had a lot of folks who joined us and we wanted to give people another opportunity to catch this in a live setting. Um, next slide, please. Uh, a couple other housekeeping items. This presentation has been um, uh, approved for one and a half learning units, um, and they are the health, safety, and welfare learning units. If you're an AIA member, and you've registered for this presentation, you should be seeing those on your transcript in about two weeks or so. Um, also, we periodically when we give webinars, we hear about audio issues that, that folks have. Uh, there's a couple of things you can do that you can try out if you're having audio problems. The first thing is to make sure that you're not using a phone call while simultaneously having um, your computer attempt to do audio. That um, to handle the audio issues, uh, that it, it tends to cause a lot of reverberation um, and echoing. If you're having problems on your phone, then try to do the computer audio. If you're having problems on computer audio, then try and do your phone. Usually one of the two of those works out, um, but, but you might want to just kind of alter, alternate between the two if you're having a hard time hearing me um, or if things start to get static or break up. Uh, we're also going to be sending you all this uh, PowerPoint and a recording of this webinar here probably by the end of the day, but no later probably than tomorrow. Um, so, so you should be expecting to see those here relatively soon. Um, and one other thing before we get get really going here, I have to give a big disclaimer. Um, although you know, myself and my co-presenter um, are attorneys, we can't provide any legal advice. Uh, and what you're going to hear over the next 90 minutes or so is really no substitution for contacting or consulting with a local attorney in your area that can help you uh, discuss and work through your very specific nuanced issues that, that you're dealing with. Uh, just a couple of examples there. We're going to be flashing up a lot of language, uh, contractual language from the A201 and the B101 uh, on our screen here and, and talking over them in, in pretty good detail. Uh, but but the reality is when you're looking, if you're following along at home, you may be looking at an edited or negotiated version of those documents. They may be worded a little bit differently than our standard uh, text that you would find in them. Also, you might be looking at a slightly outdated version. If you're looking working from an A201-2007, uh, that's gonna might be worded a little bit different than the A201-2017, which is our more our most recent version. Um, also, while it seems like uh, everyone in the country is facing the same issues at the same time, 
there are differences between your experience and what folks in your neighboring state might be experiencing. And those will have contractual and legal implications um, that might lend to different results for you. So, for example, I know right now um, ENR has a very has done a very good job on their website of keeping track of states that have mandatory closures or mandatory um, bans on construction work. I think there's four states now that do not allow any construction work, but other neighboring states they can allow construction work in certain scenarios. Um, so, so definitely keep that in mind that, that there's no one size fits all. Uh, answers to some of the questions we're going to be posing here today and talk with a local attorney uh, about your issues. So I have yet to introduce myself properly. My name is Mike Coger uh, and I am a staff attorney with the American Institute of Architects. I've been working at the AIA uh, for about seven years now uh, and I started off my career uh, as an architect. I worked for about five years uh, in the field of architecture uh, in Southern California, uh, worked for a couple of architecture firms there, went on to get my law license and practice as a private practicing attorney, um, representing clients basically at the end of the last uh, financial crisis that we had. I started my legal career in about 2009. So I worked on a lot of construction defect cases as a private practicing attorney. Uh, and then over uh, the last seven years, as I've been working at the AIA, I have uh, had the privilege, it's been real, very enjoyable to work with uh, a good group of attorneys that we have on staff, um, a lot of other consultants that we work with to create the AIA contract documents, and then a, a, a group of uh, AIA documents committee members. These are all volunteer architects from all over the country who spend a considerable amount of time uh, putting their effort and ideas into making the AIA contract documents what they are. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. I should also say that it's probably pretty obvious from if you're looking uh, behind me, I'm broadcasting from my room uh, in my house. And I have, uh, I am going to do the best I can to keep things quiet in my background. I do have a little three and a half year old daughter running around here somewhere. And uh, if she pops in, I'll try and keep it quiet. But, but um, uh, so there may be a little bit of unexpected entertainment going on in the background. Um, Joining me is Jimmy Germano. Jimmy is a, also a staff attorney at the AIA. Jimmy and I used to work down the hall from each other. Um, uh, and Jimmy is actually gonna kick off the, the big the substantive uh, topics, the first two substantive topics that we're gonna be talking about. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jimmy, if you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and then uh, get us started with force majeure and delay claims. Sure, thanks, Mike. Um, so, uh, as everybody said, or as Mike said, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jimmy Germano. I'm a staff attorney uh, at the AIA. Um, like Mike said, also, we used to work down the hall from one another. Now we're working uh, about six or seven miles apart. I'm down in uh, the Virginia suburb of DC. Um, Mike is in DC proper. Um, I, like Mike, I have some family members rolling around here, um, including a very rambunctious two year old dog uh, that likes to make himself known during these types of presentations. So, if you see a head pop up, uh, that's who that is. Um, also, just before we get into a little bit more of the substance, you are seeing right now on your screen, I think, uh, two live webcams, one of me, one of Mike, uh, and then the presentation itself. If you wanna just see the presentation, there's an option to do that. I think you just click and drag uh, at the top of where uh, our pictures are and you kind of minimize that, or there might be an X out option there. Um, but there is certainly a way just to get the substance if you really want to see that. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Jimmy Giovanno. Again, I'm an attorney uh, at the AIA. I uh, was in private practice for about seven years before I joined the AIA. Most of that time I spent doing construction work, um, representing uh, subcontractors, contractors, architects, uh, suppliers, owners uh, in litigation, uh, arbitration, contract negotiation claims, uh, on both private practice and um, government side. So I've um, been with AIA for a little while now, doing mostly the same type of work that Mike's been doing. Um, so we're gonna get in now to the substance of the presentation, which is why all of you are here. Um, force majeure has been a term that you've heard a lot. So force majeure uh, is a term that you're probably hearing a lot about. You're wondering if it applies to you, how it applies, what it means and all that. And that's what we're gonna get into right now. So. These first couple slides are entitled Force Majeure, What and Where Is It? 
And when I say where is it, I mean where in the AIA documents is it located? We're going to get into that here in a couple of slides. But first, let's talk about what it is. Force majeure, it's a French term. It literally translates to a superior force or a greater force. And it is, at its core, a risk allocation uh, principle. So the idea behind a force majeure clause is to essentially embody the following concept. Construction contracts uh, anticipate and have um, mechanisms in place to apportion risk. And then as a result of the apportioning risk, it adjusts project schedules, contract time, contract sum, et cetera, if a party is unable to complete their contractual duties due to a superior force that comes into play or that occurs. So one thing to understand is that a clause does not have to be titled force majeure or it doesn't even have to use the words force majeure to do the same thing that a force majeure clause does. In fact, as you can see on your screen here, there's case law from various jurisdictions that interprets force majeure clauses very narrowly. And what that means is that a force majeure clause is going to be read to include only those things that are specifically listed in a force majeure clause, if the clause is titled force majeure. So, what that means is if, if parties are going to go through the exercise of listing all of the types of events that could potentially trigger this force majeure type um, result, then they better list everything. So uh, a good quote from a case that embodies this concept is here on the next page. This is the Cal Kim Corp case. It's a 1987 case out of uh, New York. And what this case says is the second sentence really is the important one. And it says, ordinarily, only if the force majeure clause specifically includes the event that actually prevents a party's performance, will that party be excused. Meaning, unless you listed it, you can't rely on it as a triggering event. So in that sense, it can be in all of the party's interests to a contract to leave a force majeure clause written very broadly so that any event, if it's substantial enough to cause a delay, can trigger force majeure rights. And what I mean by that is it may be in the party's interest to not specifically list events that may or may not trigger a force majeure clause. Because, and this is an interesting aside from the Cal Kim Corp case, in that case there was a force majeure clause that listed, for example, five or six things that could be considered force majeure events, a pandemic, an act of war, an act of terrorism, uh, an unforeseen and substantial weather event, things like that. There was also a catch-all that said, and other similar type events. Well, the judge in Calcaim Corp said, well, none of your specifically listed events occurred. In this case, it was something else. And the party said, well, wait a minute, we had a catch-all that said other similar type events. Well, remember, these clauses are going to be interpreted narrowly, at least in some jurisdictions. And what the judge said in that case was, well, you had a catch-all, but that catch-all said similar type events, which means only events that are very similar to the ones that you listed. And because the event that occurred was not similar enough to the ones that were listed, this, uh, these parties did not have a force majeure event, even though something transpired that precluded performance. So understanding that concept, that's the what. What is force majeure? Now let's go into the where. Where is it? For most standard AIA contracts, you're not going to find the term force majeure anywhere. Uh, that does not mean that the idea and the concept isn't present, however. The, the concept is present in these agreements. It's just not titled force majeure, and the term force majeure isn't used. Another significant um, um, way that the AI documents are structured is that they do not provide an extensive a laundry list of potential events that could trigger force majeure rights. Instead, it's worded and it's left very broad to be interpreted by the parties. And if you go down this road, you could easily think of two, three, four pages worth of events that could trigger force majeure type issues on a contract. So in this sense, what you'll see here on the next couple of slides is one or two clauses in the AI documents that are 
utilized in the same way as fourth majeure clause, but you won't see that kind of specifically enumerated listing. So with that, take a step back for one second, having explained what force majeure is and where it is and where it isn't. Uh, let's go into a little bit about what you're going to see today. So again, as Mike previewed, we're going to be talking about um, and demonstrating how the AIA's various agreements allocate the type of force majeure risks, even though the documents may not use the term force majeure. We're going to go through owner contractor agreements, contractor subcontractor agreements. We're going to talk about owner architect agreements and architect consultant agreements. Now, one thing to understand, and we're going to cover them in that order, but one thing to understand here is if you are a consultant or if you're an architect or if you're a subcontractor, even though we're going to be talking about owner contractor agreements first, those same concepts are likely going to apply to every other set of agreement, every other set of agreements that we talk about. So we may list a few more clauses from the owner contractor agreements and talk about them and the wording and how they work, but that doesn't mean that those same clauses and principles and concepts are not present in the owner architect agreement. It just means that we decided to go into them in more detail first using the owner contractor set, and then we reference maybe a little nuances later on from the owner architect on a consultant set. So we would um, suggest that it's beneficial for architects and consultants and subs to really pay attention to the first set of documents that we talk about the owner contractor because that uh, is really going to inform the rest of the conversation and likewise for contractors and owners um, it would probably be beneficial to continue listing all the way to the end because some of those concepts are going to come into play there's also flow down issues that come into play that we'll talk about that makes all of these issues kind of interrelated to each other so with that Let's go into the first sort of clause we're going to talk about today. Again, owner contractor delays is where you're likely going to see a lot of this pop up, the COVID-19 type issues. So when you're talking about COVID-19, the first clause that comes into play is, in all likelihood, it's going to be the one that you see on your screen right now. Um, in our reading of the A201, our understanding of the types of issues that contractors and owners are having right now, it's this type of language and it's this clause that is likely going to be triggered uh, in more cases than, than uh, others. So what we're going to do here, given that, we're going to break down 8.3.1, it's your delay clause, and we're going to talk about how it's set up and why it's set up the way it is so that um, there can be a greater understanding for how this clause works, how it's intended to work. So if you look at the clause in front of you, we're talking 8.3.1. And you want to look at those three words that are highlighted in red. So the three words highlighted in red are if, then, and shall. So 8.3.1, it's just one sentence. It's got five subsections. We'll break a couple of those down in a minute. But at its core, this clause is a very long if-then sentence. So if this happens, then this shall happen. So the third word that's highlighted is the word shall. And the word shall is a term of art in contract law, in um, when you're talking about like codes and laws and things like that. The word shall means something different than the word could or can or might or may or may, maybe will, something like that. Shall is, um, it means that it's automatic. Whatever is happening shall happen. There's very little, if not if any, discretion there for everything before the shall. Um, so we're talking if, then, shall. So with that in mind, the um, analytical framework can begin to understand how 8.3.1 works. So with COVID-19 issues, contractors are likely going to be delayed, right? Delayed at any time. So that you're talking right here in the if portion of the sentence. So if a contractor is delayed at any time in the commencement or progress of the work, just to give you a little bit of background, the reason why commencement or, or progress, the reason why that term was used there is to show that a contractor can be delayed in the progress of the work, meaning the work is ongoing uh, and they are currently delayed in their progressing forward of the work, or in the commencement of the work, meaning they perhaps have been given a notice to proceed. They haven't started yet, but they can't start because they're being delayed. So those two types of delays can come into play with COVID-19 type issues. 
So I mentioned earlier there were five subsections of uh, Article 8.3.1. So subsection three has some language here that is probably going to be triggered or potentially triggered in COVID-19 type cases. So we're going to talk about these in a little bit more detail. So you're looking at unusual delays in deliveries, unavoidable casualties, and other causes beyond the contractor's control. Those three clauses are the ones in subsection three that are highlighted on your screen. And when you talk about unusual delays in deliveries, an example of that would be, you know, for example, uh, a project that might have Italian marble coming in. Well, marble coming in may be delayed. You're gonna be delayed in getting your delivery of marble more than you thought you would, have, of course. So the contractor might be delayed in progressing the work forward. Uh, an unavoidable casualty, an unavoidable casualty is sort of a legally fancy word for like an unavoidable accident, something that was outside of the contractor's control that may or may not come into play with COVID issues. Uh, and then other causes beyond the contractor's control. And it's sort of a mini catch-all within subsection three. Um, basically the contractor saying something happened that was beyond my control and that's going to be why I'm delayed. So these three little phrases within subsection three are going to be things that are potentially triggered again by COVID-19 issues. So if we use those and expand out, let's read this clause if a, you know, one, one of these three things happen. So it's gonna be everything that's highlighted on your screen. So 8.3.1 would be, if the contractor is delayed at any time in the commencement or progress of the work by unusual delays in deliveries, unavoidable casualties, or other causes beyond the contractor's control, then the contract time shall be extended for such reasonable time as the architect may determine. I'm gonna pause here for a second and understand, again, this goes back to the if-then nature of this clause, but understand here that um, there are some, I think uh, some contractors may misunderstand when the architect becomes involved in delay claims. So, if you're under subsection three at 8.3.1, the section that's highlighted on your screen here, then the contract time is already going to be extended at the time the architect becomes involved and starts to look at this issue. The contract time shall be extended. The architect becomes involved to determine how long, essentially, the quantum of this issue, not the entitlement phase. It's already been determined if the contract is delayed that the contract time shall be extended, and then the architect determines the reasonableness of the extension. So understanding that little nuance there, let's go to another clause, uh, another subsection that may come into play, the subsection five. Subsection five is a much broader catch-all, and it says, other causes that the contractor asserts and the architect determines justify delay. So if a contractor is gonna make a delay claim under subsection five, for another cause that the contractor asserts justify a delay. Then the architect has to get involved a little bit earlier and actually determine that the contractor's arguments justify a delay. And one way to differentiate between number five, subsection five and subsection three that we looked at earlier is under subsection five, the cause that the contractor asserts justify delay you look at the language of it, it doesn't necessarily have to be beyond the contractor's control. So subsection five is a little bit more broad and it allows a contractor to assert um, causes that have justified a delay in the contractor's opinion and arguably a cause that was somehow, at least somewhat within the contractor's control. But if the contractor is gonna make that type of argument, then the architect has to get involved before the shall and say either yes or no, or in part, um, agree or disagree with the contractor. And if the architect determines that that trigger justifies the delay, then the contract time shall be extended. So again, pulling it out and reading with subsection five, it's if the contractor is delayed at any time in the commencement of progress to work by other causes that the contractor asserts and the architect determines justify delay, then the contract time shall be extended for such reasonable time as the architect may determine. That's a little bit of the difference there between subsection three and subsection five, and it's important to understand the level of involvement that the architect has 
um, being a little bit less in subsection three and a little bit more in subsection five and why that might be the case. So if you jump down to section, the two sections that are on the bottom of your screen there, uh, the ones that we haven't talked about yet, 8.3.2 and 8.3.3, I'm gonna mention them briefly. So 8.3.2, claims relating to time shall be made in accordance with applicable provisions of Article 15. What that means is that if a contractor is going to make a claim under 8.3.1, they have to follow the requirements that are set forth elsewhere in the contract, including Article 15, your, your claims provision, your, uh, your disputes provision, the notice provisions of the contract, all of those types of articles that might come into play um, need to be followed if the contractor is going to submit a claim. 8.3.3 is uh, essentially the, the reverse of the no damages for delay provision. So we've gotten questions at the AIA as to, well, the, the AIA documents 8.3.1 does a good job of setting forth specifically how a contractor can get time, but how does a contractor get money damages for delays related to COVID? Uh, well, what 8.3.3 says is that a contractor can make a claim under 831, and the making of a claim in the wording of 8.3.1 doesn't preclude recovery for damages for delay under the other provisions of the contract documents. So it leaves the avenue open to get money damages for delay claims. So looking here uh, at, remember we referenced Article 15 earlier? So looking here at claims for additional time in Article 15. If the contractor wants to make a claim for additional time, they have to provide notice. So notice is gonna be provided in section 15.1.3 and 15.1.3 sets forth how notice is going to be given. And the reason why 15.1.6.1, the last screen, is important is it provides that the contractor's claim shall include an estimate of cost and of the probable effect of a delay on the progress of the work. So what that means is you need to understand how 15161 sets forth the requirement for what needs to be included in your uh, delay claim if you're going to submit one. And then you'll see here again, 1513 is mentioned. So 1513 is your notice provision. Excuse me, 1513, uh, specifically in 15131, um, sets forth that a claim needs to be uh, initiated within, and the default is 21 days, 21 days after occurrence of the event giving rise to such claim, or within 21 days after the claimant, in this case it would be the contractor, first recognizes the condition giving rise to the claim, whichever one of those is later. So what you want to understand here is consult with your attorney, consult your contract here, and um, get your notice in early. So make sure you don't waive this claim. You can work with the other project parties and with the council to make sure you do that. Section 1.6.2, again, bouncing around the contract a little bit, but this is how you have to interpret contracts to, to make sure everything kind of fits in together. 1.6.2 is a provision that provides how notice is to be delivered. So actually, how do you send notice? And the default here in section 1.6.2 is by certified or registered mail, or by courier providing uh, proof of delivery. So that seems relatively straightforward. And I mean, you know, the parties could have um, changed, say, electronic mail is fine, or maybe they have um, digital data protocols or BIM protocols in place on their project to say that they, you know, they're allowed to have this method, and that's completely fine. But if you only have section 1.6.2, Tying this back to COVID-19, let's throw a hypothetical out there. Let's say that um, you usually do by courier providing proof of delivery, and your courier is closed, and you otherwise send a certified or registered mail, and um, the office is closed. So you can't send it by certified or registered mail or by courier uh, providing proof of delivery. How do you do that? Well, how you do that is communicate with the other project parties, right? There is something that is keeping you from fulfilling your contract obligation. And there are legal principles that might come into play um, in 
situation if you are unable to um, to uh, fulfill or comply your contract obligations. So um, with that, I will I'll turn it back over to Mike to talk a little bit about uh, suspension. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. That was uh, a very good, you know, dissection of uh, those delay provisions and notice provisions. Um, and it kind of reminded me as you were going through 831, that that's the same kind of analysis, that very detailed dissecting of a clause and, and thinking it through in, in that minute detail, that it reminded me of reading, you know, like a legal opinion from a judge. I mean, this is the way that judges um, look at um, you know, contract provisions. And that's the level of analysis that goes on is this very granular um, dissecting a sentence. So thanks for doing that. Um, I do want to go over some hypotheticals. We we have talked about a couple on our Friday webinar, but also we got a couple other questions from folks to maybe tease out this uh, issue a little bit more. Um, before we get into the delay issues, and I got a few questions about those, we did get a question from someone that says, uh, particularly with regard to notice of claims. Um, uh, this person was asking, why do we require um, as a standard in section 162 that a notice of a claim be by certified or registered mail or by courier providing proof of delivery? And I'll give at least my thoughts on that or my understanding, and then you can let me know if you if you remember anything differently from our deliberations on this. But there's a certain gravity to uh, a claim um, by a contractor or an owner by anyone on the project uh, that that we did not want that to get missed with all of the other um, digital data traffic. Uh, so we want there's a, the gravity of a claim. We wanted to make sure that the parties were put on notice and it didn't just slide by in an email or on an FTP site or Dropbox or something like that. Um, and that's why we went with the more formal, traditional process of you know, requiring a notice of a claim to be by a certified or registered mail or by the uh, by a courier. Do you, is that how you remember, um, or is that, is that how you understand that issue? Uh, yeah, I think that's, um, my additional understanding of it is that um, all three of those methods um, sort of inherently include, if, and courier specifically say, a proof of delivery. So a certified or registered mail uh, the person who sends it, so let's say the contractor sends notice, certified or registered mail, they get something back that says that that piece of paper, that document, that package was actually received and in most cases signed for, and a courier can do the same thing. If you have something like a Dropbox or even an email, um, let's see, even an email with a delivery receipt, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be received uh, or read by the other party. Um, so it just it's a way to elevate the level of fairness noting, like you said, that a, a claim is a very important document that's going to be submitted. It's also timestamped, uh, and I would imagine, you know, everything else that's done nowadays electronically is going to be timestamped as well, but you can say uh, exactly who received it, who signed for it, when they got it, uh, et cetera, and it's a way to keep the process a little bit more formal and, and fair to every party. I mean, I, I don't think, it, you know, an owner uh, or an architect who might get three, four, five hundred emails a day related to a project and some of them might just be little questions about you know, the color of some, some trim or molding or something like that. And oh, by the way, here's a $15 million delay claim, uh, you know, see attached. And that, that kind of thing needs to be a little bit different. Uh, and so that's why that's structured differently. Again, the parties can change it if they want to though. Yep, absolutely, I agree with that, um, with everything you said there. So let's talk through some hypotheticals. Um, you sure. know, just like in law school, we, you know, in law school, you, you end up reading a particular piece of uh, of law, and then you tease it out with all of the different potential factual scenarios that could come into play. Um, so let's let's do that a little bit here, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Okay. So the first the the first one is um, I don't know. I guess pretty straightforward, I suppose. Let's say I'm a contractor, and and uh, okay. So let's say I'm a contractor, and and I'm in a state where the governor or the mayor of my city has mandated that all construction be stopped. Um, and right at this point, we don't really know how long that's going to be, but let's assume a month or two, something like that. Uh, do you think that would qualify, uh, that contractor would qualify uh, for a delay under 831? Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go, I'll go back a couple slides. We can look at the language of 831 here, uninterrupted there. Um, so I, 
I'm an attorney, uh, so I'm going to say uh, it depends. Uh, you never give an absolute answer, but I think this is probably as close as you can get to an absolute. If if you have been, if it is illegal for you to go back to the project site and your governor or your mayor or whatever the case is, um, I think this was the two examples you gave, uh, says that you cannot work. I think that would uh, rise to the level of triggering the rights that are in 8.3.1. Again, you know, some fact might be out there that uh, makes it a little bit more nuanced, but I think that's a, a clear cut example of when uh, 8.3.1, the force majeure type issue would kind of come into play. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, this one's kind of black and white uh, for me as well. I, I think there's, you know, there's always exceptions to every rule. And, but it's been, I can't even think of like a, you know, what is that factual pattern that would lead me to say, uh, no, you don't get a delay when the, when the governor has shut down your construction site. Um, you know, I've been in, you've probably as well been involved in a number of delay claims where a contractor will say, will make the argument that, okay, it's rained for 10 days in this in January, but the typical rain in January in my area is seven days, so I should be getting a delay. And my, my initial thought with all of those kinds of things are, well, that's not what this provision's about. This is what this provision's about. If a governor says you can't work, you know, to me, that's, a, that, that's why this provision that other causes beyond the con, uh, contractor's control language is in this contract. So I think that's a pretty black and white one, um, for me at least, you know, again, there may be some exceptions to it, um, but I think it'd be a, a difficult argument to make uh, for most folks. So, uh, okay, so let's do another one here that's a little bit more nuanced. Let's say I'm a well, contractor. I will, actually, I'm, I will say, please, I'll maybe disagree with you a little bit on that. And the, the weather example, having represented a decent amount of contractors, um, I think the weather example in 831, there is language saying adverse weather conditions but I do agree that that is um, a very difficult standard to meet uh, and not, not really what we're talking about here at this presentation. I did want to highlight that and say that, that it may or may not come into play. There's definitely a high hurdle and you have to do all types of measurements and what's typically reported in the area on a given year and, and your, your measured mile approach for how productive you otherwise would have been, et cetera. Um, but I, I actually hadn't really focused on the adverse weather conditions, but I saw it as you were looking at the conditions. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. No, no, no. Fair, no, very good point. Very good point. Um, okay, so let's take our next one. And let's say I'm a contractor and uh, I'm allowed to work. At least, the, no, there's not been a governor or, you know, mayor shutdown of my project. Uh, but I've had, you know, very uh, a difficult time getting materials or equipment of some sort onto my project. Um, and the kind of things that I, two months ago when I entered into the contract, I I would have easily been able to get these materials and this equipment. Now I can't, or it's become difficult. What do you think about that one? Will that qualify for a delay uh, under 831? Um, th that one's a little bit more tricky. Um, I think that would be very fact specific, um, but you mentioned uh, the term like a, a delay in getting something delivered or a piece of equipment or something. And I think that the, the final answer is probably yes, um, but this would bring in to play the concept of mitigation of damages, I think. So, uh, and, and to explain that a little bit is, let's say that you're on a contract and you expected to have your large crane delivered to the site um, you know, two weeks ago and it hasn't been delivered. So you're, that's an unusual delay in delivery, for example, a contractor is gonna make that argument. Well, that may very well be, but unless that's on the critical path, and there's no other work that can be done on the project to move the project forward, the contractor has an obligation uh, under you know, common law principles to move the project forward as much as they can um, in light of the circumstances. So if they're allowed to work, but some piece of equipment, uh, so you know their, their crane may not have been delivered, but let's say they can go on some other aspect of the work and maybe lay some tile or you know, do whatever other um, may be available on the project, they have an obligation to mitigate damages that have been caused by the delayed delivery of this crane. Uh, so I think that um, probably yes, but the mitigation issue would come into play a little bit more here with this hypothetical. Is that, is that what you were thinking? Yeah, I, this one is one where I kind of, I think we just need to know more. It's, you know, based, this is why you really need to get into the facts and the, the specifics of what materials, what equipment, you know, do they 
do those delays really impact your critical path? Um, uh, you know, if you're, for example, if you're waiting on a piece of equipment that is on the critical path and you just can't do anything else, um, or if you're going to be delayed for every day that that piece of equipment has not arrived on site, um, that probably would qualify for a delay. But, you know, if you're pouring a foundation for a, a house and your windows or something are delayed, that probably that might not uh, because uh, they're they're not on the critical path. So I think you just need to know a little bit more about that, um, about exactly what those issues are and what what things are not being delivered on time. Um, okay, so I've got a, a couple of more and then we'll and we'll move on. But um, let's see, I'm going to go in a little bit different order this time. What about, we had someone ask a question on our Friday webinar that I thought was interesting. You know, what if you have a contractor who's already delayed for reasons that have nothing to do with COVID-19? They're behind a month because it was something that was within the contractor's control that they did wrong, whatever. Um, does, and, and now you've got a work stoppage mandated by a governor or a mayor. Uh, does that, you know, the question was, does that excuse all of those prior delays? And I'll give my my initial thoughts on that and let you weigh in, Jimmy. But my sure. thinking is, well, of course, you, you'd really have to parse out the two. I mean, certainly the fact that there are delays that are due to COVID-19 mandatory construction stoppages is not going to get the contractor off the hook for already being delayed. Um, it's just, you know, and I'll leave up the, leave the specific kind of mathematical, you know, quantification of that to you know, whoever's dealing with those issues, but let's say they're a month behind and there's a work stoppage for a month. Now they're two months behind. One month's going to be um, excusable under 831 and that other month that they were already behind isn't going to be. Is that anything to add on that one? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, that, that would be very fact specific as to the, the extent to which COVID-19 Cause they delay to the project, uh, and that cause was outside of the contractor's control. And then everything else the contractor may have been behind for, you know, they, they may own that. Uh, so, yeah, it would, you kind of really have to parse out to do that. Correct. Um, yep, absolutely. So, okay, one more, and then uh, we'll move on a little bit. So, one issue that I know contractors are dealing with right now let's say I'm a contractor and um, there's not been a mandatory work stoppage in my state, but um, but I'm concerned. Like I've been I've been seeing CDC recommendations for social distancing. Uh, I've been you know I've got like my employees, my workers. They're worried about being on a site. Um, you know what do you think contractors can do in that situation, or should be doing? So this is. I think this is one of the more difficult situations that uh, COVID-19, like the current state of our you know, construction uh, industry right now is in, is these situations where work might be possible, it might be legal to go perform work, there's not a stoppage, but there are suggestions uh, or guidelines to follow with respect to social distancing, cleanliness of work sites, et cetera. Uh, and that's something where the you know a contract a even something like the a201 you know close to 40 page general condition document when you tie it to like an a101 for you're talking almost you know 60 pages worth of text even a document that long is not going to anticipate every single uh possibility that might come into play so this is one of course that you know no one can really foresee and I think that in this situation, there's not going to be a contract clause that says, you know, in the case of a pandemic where you can physically work, but there are guidelines in place, you should do X. This one's going to be a little bit more business judgment and common sense and communication. Uh, and I, there's, there's no easy answer. It's going to be fact specific. Uh, communicate with your owner, uh, your contractors, your subcontractors, your architects, everybody to get on the same page with respect to what you're doing. I mean, unfortunately, there's not a contract provision that's directly on point with an issue like this. And it's a very tough situation. You, you can work, but maybe your, your employees don't feel safe working, um, which, I mean, that could bring in like OSHA issues where the contractor has to provide a safe workplace uh, for its employees uh, and every, everybody does under OSHA. Um, and then the contractors 
contract obligations to provide job site safety. Uh, how does that come into play? And these are all things, these are you know bridges that have not been crossed yet in terms of case law and interpretation and things. So we'll just have to see where it goes. Is that kind of right? yeah? No, I, I agree. I think you know, right where we're you know, we're kind of struggling with this one is there's just no precedent here. Uh, you know, you can look at pretty much anything that comes up on a construction project or, you know, in a design phase of a, of a project, like there's going to be some precedent out there. I mean, you know, there's been judges and courts all over the country that have been producing opinions every single day. And you, you can almost always go back and find how uh, a judge has interpreted a piece of language or a concept right. or something. We just don't have that here. So we are, we are kind of struggling a little bit with, uh, we're inventing things, you know, to some degree. But I think a good rule of thumb, I suppose, would be, um, you know, follow whatever recommendations apply to your particular site. So if you can follow CDC recommendations or if there are OSHA recommendations out there for job site safety in a COVID-19, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID-19 impacted site. Um, and then also, I know even like the District of Columbia where I live, I saw very recently our our government has put out, our, our local government has put out a recommendation for construction sites. And I've even seen this play out um, in a site near my house, I think. I don't really know anything about that site other than the fact that I've been by it on a number of occasions. And it, you know, on a normal day, there's just a beehive of activity. It is extremely busy. They've they're obviously fast tracking this project, but over the last couple of weeks or so, they have really scaled things down as far as the number of workers on site. Um, so if you can look at, you know, things like number of trades, limiting the number of trades, providing protective equipment, those kinds of things would be a first step um, towards attempting to, you know, follow recommendations that are out there and keep the job site safe. Ultimately, though, like you mentioned, it is the... Um, uh, the contractor is responsible for job site safety. And that used to mean, you know, a month or two ago, that meant, you know, let's make sure everyone's tying off and wearing hard, hard hats. Now it means something a little bit different. So you need to be thinking about that obligation. And if you truly don't feel like you can provide a, um, you know, a, a safe job site, then, you know, you, you, you know, that you probably could make the argument that you are entitled to a delay, even in a shutdown situation. Um, so anything else on that? Okay. Anything else on that before I uh, move on? Uh, no. no, I think you did a great job. Those are really okay. good. Yeah, that, that's what a lot of people are dealing with right now. Those types of issues. So I think just kind of walking through them is, is a helpful exercise. Absolutely, and we, you know, we spend a lot of time on this, right? But it's because we're getting a lot of questions. So for those of you who are waiting on the owner architect issues, we'll get to those. I promise. Um, we'll get to them. You know, in about. 15 or 20 minutes or so, but we will spend a good amount of time on those issues as well. Um, remember, we're, we're going to try to keep this to 90 minutes. If we go over a little bit, you know, we'll, we'll continue doing that to, to, to finish out the webinar as, as we can. You'll, you'll also be receiving um, the slides and the presentation itself. So if you have to cut out for another meeting um, and then come back and review the back half of the webinar, uh, you can do that as well. Um, any, do you have any tips for, um, for contractors, you know, uh, that are dealing with delays right now before we get to owner suspension? Um, you know, I saw, I saw an article uh, and I've, I've been trying to find it and I can't find it, but it's, it's three, um, the, the three C's can into play here and it's kind of sort of an easy way to remember it. And it's consult your contract, consult your attorney uh, and communicate with the rest of the project parties. Uh, and I, I, I can't summarize it any more succinctly. Than that. And I think that's just a great, um, sort of fallback right now when there might not be a, a contract clause that comes into play with some of this. So the best thing to do is read your contract to see if it's there, consult your attorney to make sure, uh, and then just communicate with everybody about the project. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, my, you know, couple of things I wrote down is for takeaways for contractors when you're dealing with this. If there's a notice provision, you have to provide notice of something. Um, make sure in your contract, make sure you're doing it to the letter of your contract. Um, you know, if you have to provide it, you know, within a certain number of days or after a certain event, do that, in you know, make sure you don't miss out on those things. Uh, second is, you know, when you are documenting, you know, when you, it's one thing to be entitled to additional time and additional money for a delay. Uh, it's another thing to be able to prove it in a way that doesn't, you know, breed conflict. Um, so I've been on projects or 
worked, I've worked on cases where someone's claimed for months and years on end that they're entitled to money and, and, and time for a delay, but they just don't, they don't provide the like detail that, that an owner would need to see in order to write a check. Um, so make sure you're documenting uh, all of your delay time and all of your delay extra costs and, and set those things aside um, from an accounting perspective, you know. Uh, and, and I mentioned on our last time we did this webinar that uh, there's a firm, uh, a, a law firm, Picard and Abramson, they did a very good uh, and detailed uh, um, article on, on, uh, on, how to, on how to handle, you know, delay costs and time and how to account for those things. So I would, I would get on their website and check that out. Thought it was really good. So thanks, Jimmy. I'll give you a break here, and I'll uh, I'll take owner suspension and termination uh, for convenience issues. Um, uh, so yeah, so owners, uh, you know, you do have a couple of different options for dealing with this, even if you have not had a a, a state or a city uh, mandated stoppage of construction. Uh, the A201 gives you a couple of avenues for when unforeseen things happen on a job site or on a project. Uh, you do have, and we'll get into the details of this a little bit more in the next few slides, but owners do have a right to suspend the project for their convenience. They also have a right to terminate uh, the construction contract for convenience as well. And these are pretty common in construction contracts. But, it, but these are not reciprocal rights. The contractor doesn't have a unilateral right to suspend operations or terminate the contract for construction without, um, for their convenience, right? They might for a cause, but, but for convenience, they don't have that reciprocal right. Um, and it is just looking at a big macro level in contracts and contract law, it's fairly uncommon for one party to have a right that the other party doesn't have, particularly the right to terminate or suspend operations. So there are a number of protections in the A201 um, for contractors uh, when they are have their operations suspended um, or when they've been terminated for convenience. So we'll look at those a little bit as well. Um, <clears throat> So you find the owner suspension for convenience language in section 14.3 of the A201. Uh, it is really broken down into two parts. There's a couple things to highlight here. It's the, the owner's right and the breadth of the owner's right. And then the contractor's entitlement once the owner has exercised the right to suspend the contract or suspend the project. 14.3.1, uh, um, you'll see that that right is fairly broad. It says the owner may without cause order the contractor in writing to suspend, delay, or interrupt the work in whole or in part for such period of time as the owner may determine. Um, so I know just in my neighborhood here alone, we've had a couple of projects that have been uh, suspended uh, when we don't have a mandatory work stoppage. Uh, so, so I know owners have been exercising that, that kind of a right. Uh, if that happens, the contractor is entitled under 14.3.2 to an adjustment to the contract sum and the contract time and that are caused by that suspension. And the way that procedurally would occur is if the parties can agree to the adjustment in the time and the sum, uh, then they would execute a change order, which is uh, document G701 uh, in AIA's library. If they can't agree to an adjustment in time or sum, uh, then they would need to, one party would need to file a claim. The contractor would need to file a claim for those additional costs and time, uh, and then go through the claims process that Jimmy's going to outline here, you know, in a few minutes. Um, the next so, option that, a, yes, Mike, I, have a, I have a question. In looking at 14.3.2, you had, um, you had said earlier, um, I think one of our attendees from Friday had a question about, well, what if the contract contractor had been delayed a little bit uh, you know, maybe by their own fault before COVID happened and then they've been delayed again. Um, is that the kind of thing that 14.3.2, like that second sentence, um, no adjustment shall be made to the extent that performance was delayed, uh, that the contractor was responsible for? Is that kind of how that would play out, do you think? Yeah, certainly. That's that's exactly what that's trying to to, to get to here is that, you know, to the extent that the contractor has been at fault for a delay, they're not going to be compensated for it simply because the owner has suspended the project. So that gets into that apportioning kind of, you know, divvying up which delay was caused by which action, you know, or by what fault or cause. Um, 
I assume you, you have anything else to add on that one? No, no, I just, I, I had that question in front of mind and I was reading 14.3.2 as you were going through it and thinking that's probably how that would come into play, but I wanted to get your take on that. So thanks for- Yep, that, that's exactly right, good catch. Um, so the next option that owners may be exercising is the right to terminate for convenience. Uh, if 2008, 2009 or any guide, you know, Oh, the underlying thoughts that went into projects that are in the design phase, um, you know, that an owner might have thought was a good idea two months ago. Maybe right now it's not such a good idea, particularly if you're opening things that are closed. You've got a bar you're looking at or a restaurant. You know, owners might be thinking about just entirely terminating those contracts if they haven't really started construction yet, or even if they're in the middle of construction, it's possible. Um, and so uh, A201 does give the owner a unilateral right to terminate the project, uh, the, the construction contract for convenience. We find that language in section 14.41. It is as broad uh, as the language above uh, in the suspension, um, the, uh, right? Uh, it says the owner may at any time terminate the contract for the owner's convenience and without cause. Uh, there are a few things that a contractor really need to pay attention to if this happens. Uh, under 14.42, you have to do the contractor is obligated to do three things when they get notice of uh, a termination for convenience. Uh, and these are important things to do. Um, the, the contractor has to uh, immediately cease operations as directed by the owner, pretty obvious. Uh, but the second thing is they have to take all necessary um, actions to protect and preserve the work. So, you know, things like uh, securing, the, securing the site, that could mean things like protecting things from weather, um, that might be exposed and get damaged if the contractor just walks off and you know and just leaves everything in its current uh, situation. Um, so they have to do do those two activities. In addition to that, they have to um, terminate uh, all existing subcontracts and purchase orders, uh, and then also not enter into any more subcontracts and purchase orders. The idea is that the contractor is, of course, going to be hiring out a bunch of subs and by purchasing things. If the owner has put a notice to terminate for convenience, that contractor needs to act in accordance with that and terminate all the downstream activity that's going on in a project, and not incur any more liability for the owner uh, from a downstream perspective. Um, and if the contractor does those things, uh, we'll see in section 14.4.3 that the contractor is entitled to a handful of things um, for in, in terms of compensation. First of all, the uh, contractor will be entitled to compensation for work that is properly executed uh, for costs incurred by reason of the termination. That's things like, you know, all the activity that costs to protect the project. Uh, the contractor can get payment for those. Um, also costs attributable to termination of subcontracts. So restocking fees, you know, any kind of little penalties or whatever there might be um, involved in terminating subcontracts contractor is going to get paid by the owner for that. Uh, and lastly, uh, the contractor will be entitled to a termination fee, if any, is set forth in the agreement. And this is where we have to point to another document, right? The A201 references a termination fee, but you'll find that termination fee in the agreement between the parties, which is either the A101, the A102, or A103. And just kind of a reminder that the A201 doesn't operate on its own. You have to pair it up with an A101, 102, or 103, where all of the cost and pricing is, is negotiated between the parties. Um, and I won't go into the, too much detail about those contracts, but uh, in each one of those, there is a prompt for a termination fee that the parties can negotiate. So all, if, if, if you're in a situation like this, make sure you look back at those documents to see if you're entitled to a fee that's been negotiated by the parties. Okay, um, next topic to talk about are, you know, you're a contractor, you've been suspended. As we saw from, you know, a few slides ago that you could be suspended for a very long time. What are your rights to terminate the contract uh, under A201? Now, I, I have to say, we're not gonna talk about all of the termination rights that a contractor may have. We're gonna be talking specifically about the ones that could come into play um, due to COVID-19 work stoppages and, and and suspensions. Certainly, if the parties, uh, there's been a substantial or material breach um, of the contract by one or the other parties, 
it's going to entitle you to uh, rights to terminate the contract. Uh, and H-201 has a lot of language for those kind of um, situations, but we're not going to deal with those right now. That's another another webinar for another day. Um, there are two avenues for a contractor to terminate the construction contract due to suspensions and delays of some sort that are not caused by the contractor. Um, we find the first one in section 14.1.1. Uh, that is uh, the language you see up on your screen right now. Uh, it allows the contractor to terminate the construction contract if there's a few different things that have to be checked off. It has to be for a work stoppage of 30 consecutive days through no act or fault of the contractor. And that's 30 uh, calendar days. There's another part of A201 that clarifies that for us. Um, so if you've got 30 consecutive days, no fault or act of the contractor, um, and there is, and I'm going to just read these two bullet points here at the bottom, because I think their wording and, and what's included in them is important. Issuance of an order of a court or other public authority having jurisdiction that requires all work to be stopped. Um, and of course, there have been orders uh, by a few states out there that have required all work to be stopped. And then the second piece, um, and this is one or the other, it doesn't have to be both, but I think both could apply to some folks out there. An act of government, such as a declaration of a national emergency that requires all work to be stopped. And the way I'm reading that, which is I believe the way it's intended, it, we have had a, a national emergency declared, but it hasn't stopped all construction all over the country. But it is a such as a national uh, a declaration of national emergency. That's not the only act of government that could trigger point two. So if you've had a governor um, or a mayor of some sort who has stopped your project, I think that would also qualify under number under point two as well. So there are um, this is something that definitely could come into play for contractors as we are as we are approaching, you know, we're getting on a, a week or two of some work stoppages around the country. Mike, I have a question about this section, um, and I, I kind of had a hypothetical come into my head, if you wouldn't mind indulging me and seeing what you think about it. Let's do it. Uh, so let's say you're, you're a contractor right now, and you, you've, you've been suspended um, you know, by an order of public authority, right? You're, you're the governor in your state. She said everything needs to be stopped, and that's, that's been happening for, let's say, two weeks, right? Like 14 days. And you're, you're learning right now about 14.1.1 that says, well, if you're stopped for a period of 30 days, meaning 16 days from now, you can terminate. Um, so let's say you you are you know in-house counsel for a, a general contractor and you're, you're looking at this and you're saying, OK, like what types of things are you thinking about or considering when you're looking at 14.1.1 and your, your options? Your, just kind of how, how would you work through that? I can imagine a lot of contractors being in this situation saying, well, Maybe it might even be better for us just to be determined to be suspended for another 16 days because then we get this right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question because this is a very real. This is a, a right that the contractors are almost certainly going to have. Um, I actually kind of questioned initially whether we should put this slide and th this topic in the presentation because yeah. for me, I was thinking initially along the lines of, and I still kind of am. Like, if I'm a contractor, I want to get back to work. Um, I'm not looking to terminate my contract. Um, unless, you know, there's already an underlying problem with that contract that I, I, I'm using this to get out of it. But, you know, if I've got a, if this is a project where I'm getting paid regularly, it's keeping my team busy, it's, you know, it, it is going along other than this, it's going along just as I expected when I signed the contract. I'm not really thinking about terminating the contract because, you know, I want to get my team back to work. I want them to, you know, continue to make money for my company. Um, so I, I'm not really thinking about these kinds of things because there's not a lot of, you know, I don't know. What do you, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I guess I, I, I guess I would tend to agree with you. I mean, the, the typical contractor's right to termination would assume like your typical economic forces are coming into play, meaning lost opportunity on other projects. And there are no other projects right now. So I, I would imagine like your thinking is probably shared by uh, a lot of contractors where they want to focus on the projects they have, even if they're suspended and get back to work as quickly as possible, because it's not like there's some huge wave of work uh, that they're not getting to because they're working on this one project. Uh, so 
in, in a normal situation, this might come into play, but when everything is stopped, the, the economy, the, the forces aren't necessarily there that normally would trigger this, this right. So thanks for thinking through that. I kind of, I thought about that and I wanted to see what you thought about. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very, it's a very good point. I mean, if you're, if you do terminate, um, then what, you know, it's not like you're going to be able to go out. I assume there are not a lot of, a tremendous amount of, of new contracts for construction being signed right now um, as people are, you know, times of economic difficulty and uncertainty. Um, I can imagine, you know, everything's pulling back right now from just, you know, little things to big things. So, so I, I, I agree with everything you said there. Um, so I'm going to actually turn it back over to you. I think you're going to talk about subcontractor. Um, nope, no, I'm not. I do have one more, one other, sorry. Okay, so there is one other avenue, and I'll talk about this one relatively quickly, um, for a contractor terminating due to aggregated delays. Uh, and this is in situations, I won't read all the language here, but it's sort of similar to the, to the idea that we just talked about. But it, the triggering event here is, first of all, the contractor can't be at fault um, or can't have caused, you know, the delays or suspensions. Um, and the other triggering event is if there are... Uh, Delays that constitute an aggregate of more than 100% of the total number of delay days scheduled for completion or 120 days in any 365 day period, whichever is less. And the, that language that says 100% of the total number of days scheduled for completion is another way of saying the contract time. So if the initial contract time was 60 days, if there's a delay 60 days or actually more than 60 days, then you'll, that would trigger that right. Um, uh, these are again aggregated delays uh, that would trigger that right to terminate. Um, and then 14.1.3 is where we get the contractor's entitlement again. No real surprise here. Uh, the contractor does have to give a seven days notice as provided in 14.1.3. The contractor will get um, payment for work executed, uh, also for um, any costs attributable to the termination, and then for reasonable overhead uh, and profit. So that is kind of sums up our owner's options. Um, do you want to tell us about subcontractor issues? Sure. Yeah. So, um, like, like we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we are going through these uh, concepts in a certain order, right? So owner contractor was first. We just finished that. Now we're going to talk about contractor subcontractor agreements. There's two things to understand about contractor subcontractor agreements. And, and with that, we're going to talk about the A401 agreement. That's the, the primary contractor subcontractor agreement that the AIA publishes. The A401 is structured very similarly to the A201 that we just went through, the general conditions. So many, if not all, of the concepts that you just saw are going to be applied uh, in, you know, in the same format to the contractor subcontractor agreements. So your contractor subcontractor agreements, we're not going to go through every single clause by number and say, here's when this would apply, here's when this would like we just did, because those concepts are going to be the same. The one thing to understand in addition to that is what you're seeing on your screen, Article 2. Article 2 is what's usually referred to as a flowdown provision. Uh, typically, your flow down provision incorporates uh, the terms and conditions of the prime contract into your subcontract, right? So it's important for subcontractors to understand the terms of their prime contract so they can adhere to their requirements. And those, the terms of the prime contract may even be incorporated specifically by reference into the subcontract. So subcontractors, what, what um, it'd be prudent to take away from this is know the terms of your subcontract, and if you have a flowdown provision like Article 2 of your A401, know the terms of your prime contract because they probably incorporate by reference. So uh, one, you know, for instance, would be a claim needs to be given within 21 days, like we saw with the contractor owner agreement, right? Well, if a subcontractor wants the general contractor to pass through a claim to the owner for payment or something like that, that claim needs to be given to the general contractor in advance of that deadline so the contractor can bundle it and include it with their their big claim so it's instances like that where a subcontractor needs to understand the terms of the general contract the prime contract so that they can apply uh, and all those the rights the remedies the options available to them they can understand all of them check with counsel in your jurisdiction though because 
um, flow down provisions like this uh, are interpreted differently in different jurisdictions. So you need to understand the requirements and how they work in your various jurisdictions. So we're gonna move on to dispute resolution. We're gonna talk about dispute resolution um, in terms of the A201. The A201 is gonna be, again, incorporated by reference and it's what a lot of the other contracts are, are based on. And it, the principles are gonna be the same, again, for all of the other types of contracts and agreements that the AI publishes. So what you're seeing on your screen right now is the disputes resolution process. We've already gone through notice and claim on prior slides. We're gonna talk about continuing contract performance, your uh, initial decision and how the initial decision maker works, and then mediation and binding dispute resolution. We're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on these. It's more just kind of understanding how the concept works. So continuing contract performance is an important concept to understand uh, because it's one of the mechanisms uh, through which a contract is um, designed to speed up the process. If a construction contract falls off uh, pace, then uh, it's obviously not good for anybody. So if, a, um, if, a, if you read an A201, there are certain provisions that are in place to recognize the time is of the essence. The first one, or one of them, is your continuing contract performance. So a contractor has an obligation to continue and proceed diligently with performance of the contract, to pull the language right out of the, the clause, during the pendency of a claim, so pending final resolution of their claim. This is structured this way so that a contractor can't say, well, we have a, you know, a small claim on some other portion of the project, so we're going to walk off the job. That is not in, that's not the intent of the A201. Similarly, an owner can't say, well, you haven't completed this one portion of the work, so we're not paying you for everything else that you do. That's, again, it's not how the A201 is structured continuing contract performance for things unrelated to the final resolution of the claim itself are required. It's so one way to keep the ball rolling, uh, to keep uh, the contract and the project moving forward. The other way to do it, the other, or one of the other mechanisms in place, is through the role of the initial decision maker. The initial decision maker uh, is, uh, it's a term that was, um, developed by the AIA uh, and the IDM is by default, it's the architect. Um, the owner and the contractor can agree to make it whoever they want though in the A201. The IDM essentially is somebody who is a referee, they call balls and strikes, uh, or an umpire calling balls and strikes throughout the uh, progress of the work. And they're, they're set up this way to keep the ball moving forward, to keep the um, project moving forward so that the parties don't get stuck on litigating and disagreeing about a certain claim. So I'm gonna step through very quickly here sort of the four big picture uh, phases of a typical IDM process. And this is to um, serve as a, a refresher uh, or maybe a learning experience for people who haven't dealt with an IDM uh, process lately, or maybe they're serving as an IDM for the first time. Um, this is the how the A201 is set up to deal with this. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical here that may come into play with COVID-19 issues. Let's say you're a general contractor and you're working on a healthcare facility and your initial substantial completion date was you know, August 1st, but Three weeks ago, you were told you need to be finished by May 1st, you know, a, a substantial acceleration because you know, their beds need to be available, et cetera. You can do that, that's fine. The owner can do that, but it's going to cost more money. So your, you know, your initial contract sum was X and you're gonna say, we can do that, but it's gonna cost an additional $100,000, let's say. I mean, it would probably be significantly more for an acceleration like that, but let's just throw a round number out there. It's 100,000. So, you're told we're going to accelerate, it's going to cost an extra $100,000, and you're going to submit that uh, in, in accordance with the claims provision of the A201, your notice provisions, to the owner. And the owner says, I agree it's an acceleration, of course, I agree that it's going to cost um, more, but you're only going to get $75,000, not $100,000. We don't think it costs anything. Well, 
you're now at step one. The owner and the contractor have a disagreement arising from or related to the project. So at this point, you go to step two. The owner or the contractor, in this case, it would probably be the contractor, files a claim with the initial decision maker. Then you move on to step three. The initial decision maker evaluates the claim and they either approve, reject, or they state that they're unable to resolve the claim. And this is as the project is going forward. Again, the parties have an obligation to continue their contract performance. And in my experience, an initial decision maker will either approve or reject the claim if they're given enough information. If an IDM is not given sufficient information, if it's a $100,000 claim, in this case, a $25,000 difference type claim, and they're only given a couple of pieces of paper, it's probably not going to be enough to justify the claim. So in those instances, that's typically when you see an initial decision maker saying they are unable to resolve the claim at this time. From there, you go to step four, that initial decision maker's result is binding, but it is subject to mediation and dispute resolution after that. As a quick aside uh, to those architects uh, or consultants, project managers, uh, or parties who have not acted as an IDM lately, the AI just published an article uh, in early January on how to manage your risk when you're acting as an initial decision maker. And this is a good resource uh, that an initial decision maker can consult to kind of just make sure they're going through the process, managing their risk in uh, working through an IDM claim. Maybe they haven't done it in a while or never. And it's also a good resource if you're a party, if you're a contractor or a subcontractor, even an owner, who wants to see what, what does an IDM plan look like from the architect's perspective or from the initial decision maker's perspective? What types of things are they considering? This article might touch on some of those issues. So you can understand what their, um, what their considerations are going to be. And I'll give you a, a hint, providing more information and more complete information to the IDM is never a bad idea. So we talked about binding dispute resolution, alternative dispute resolution. Uh, it can take the form of mediation and then arbitration and litigation, and I'll just touch on those very briefly here. The mediation is a process where the parties meet and they try and resolve their dispute in a non-adversarial setting. There's going to be a uh, notice requirement in place, so they have to provide notice, uh, and there's sort of interesting ways that notice works and how it can work. We won't really get into that too much right here. But just understand that it's not intended to be adversarial. It's intended where the parties sit down, they talk about their dispute, uh, and they try and resolve it without the need to go further. If mediation fails, then they can move to more robust forms of um, dispute resolution, which can take the form of arbitration or litigation. When the parties are filling out their A201 before the project even starts, there's a checkbox to say, we want to use litigation, arbitration or other, they can select another form of dispute resolution. And uh, understand that if they choose uh, arbitration and, and mediation before them, obviously those costs associated with that are shared equally between the parties. Their attorney's fees usually aren't included in that, but the, the actual cost of using those services are there. If the parties litigate, uh, fairly shared, and when you litigate, like actually using a courthouse facility is usually is free, uh, but or maybe you know, a filing fee or something very minimal, but then your attorney's fees might be significantly more um, if you go through a full litigation to include discovery, and depositions, and motions, and all of them. So if you're at the end of this claims process, you want to understand your rights, which dispute resolution mechanism you've selected, uh, and how to best position yourself to move forward. Uh, and with that, I I think, Mike, I can turn it back over to talk a little bit about consequential damages. Excellent. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, <clears throat> so just a quick word about damages in construction disputes. Um, and this applies to architects as well as to contractors and owners. Um, we have a standard drafting policy in our, our contracts uh, to include a waiver of consequential damages. Um, so I have to you know, describe what that means. Um, there's two different damages that result of a breach of some sort uh, are going to fall into two camps. They're going to be direct damages or they're going to be consequential damages. Direct damages are the types of damages that uh, directly flow, logically flow from the breach of the contract 
If a contractor performs work in a defective manner, the direct damage that results of that is the amount of money to correct that uh, defective work or to the devaluation of the, of the work as a result. Um, uh, consequential damages are a little bit more difficult to foresee. They're more tangentially related damages. Um, they tend to be things that uh, that you know a contractor or owner might not be able to predict as easily as as the direct damages and the best way to explain those is by just looking at some of the examples uh in our a201 <clears throat> for example the owner would be uh waiving claims for things like loss of use or income or profit from a business the contractor if you can just think it through a little bit like a contractor is not going to know like if they're uh, doing work on a casino or something you know when they enter into that contract, they're not going to know what you know the the income or the yeah, for, for that casino is. So they really can't predict what their damages are going to be until they you know delayed 30 days and then all of a sudden they get a bill for 10 million dollars. Um, and similarly, there are uh, waivers for you know things like contractors' principal office expenses, um, <clears throat> compensation of personnel stationed there, loss of financing, business reputation. Uh, losses. Those are all the kinds of things that are considered consequential damages and are waived in A201 because of the very unpredictable nature of them. What we encourage folks to do is if you are concerned about those things, um, first of all, think about insurance for them rather than, than filing a claim. But secondly, ne pre negotiate them up front in the contract in a liquidated damages provision. If you are uh, the owner of that casino and you know that you are going to be out a million dollars a day if it's delayed, you know, put that into in a liquidated damages provision so that everybody knows right up front um, what the expectation is if there is a, a delay of some sort. Uh, and as long as liquidated damages are a reasonable forecast of potential damages and they're not a penalty, courts will typically uphold them. So there's a lot more information about that, but um, on other webinars that we've done and other materials. But I want to move on to the next slide where we finally get around to talking about owner architect issues. Um, and at this point, I have to apologize to all of my architect uh, brethren out there who've been waiting uh, for for us to to finally talk about this issue. We, as you can imagine, we didn't have months to prepare this webinar and to think about it. We've, uh, you know, our timing is going to be a little, it has been a little off, and we've gone long on this uh, on the contractor stuff because there's so many nuances to those contractor issues that we've already talked about. Um, I, we're going to continue on here. We're going to go as long as as this warrants. Um, uh, we'll definitely go past that 90 minute mark and if you if you can't hang on the line with us here for, for that discussion then please just you know wait until you, you'll get the presentation uh you know via email here within the next day or so and you know i encourage you to go back and listen to some of the stuff if you're particularly been waiting on it so of course architects are um you know they are not immune to the issues of work stoppages um, being afraid to go out onto job sites, um, work suspensions, those kinds of things. Uh, so we're going to talk through a handful of issues with regard to how COVID-19 issues uh, have been, you know, impacting architects and then how the contracts that the AIA offers, particularly the B101, uh, handles those issues. If you are using some of our other B100 series documents, like the B105 and B104, um, we'll try to give you some references to the similar clauses in those documents, but uh, fundamentally, these are we're going to be talking about B101, and a lot of the language in B101 flows right down. We, we use that same exact language in B104 and 5, and in B102 as well. So, um, so when, when we talk about uh, an architect and the way they perform their services and whether or not those services are performed adequately or what, you know, we always have to start by discussing the architect's standard of care. And in B101, you find that in section 2.2. Uh, if you're looking at B105, that's in article one. In B104, that's in section uh, 2.1. The exact same language, same concepts. Um, <clears throat> and the architect's standard of care is the standard by which the architect will be judged in evaluating the architect's performance. And it is context specific, situation specific. So it states that the architect shall perform its services consistent with the professional skill and care ordinarily provided by architects practicing in the same or similar locality under the same or similar circumstances. 
the architect shall perform its services as expeditiously as is consistent with such professional skill and care and the orderly progress of the work. So, of course, if you've uh, been paying attention to what I just read, this is not a standard of perfection. And uh, it is a standard that is flexible. So, uh, under the same or similar circumstances, well, things have changed now for architects in the way they do their work um, than the way architects do their work two months ago. I mean, we're all, you know, architects are now working from home. Um, they might, you know, be delayed in their services as well um, due to a number of different factors. You know, zoning board that you need to get approval from, they're not operating now. Well, there's a pretty good, um, uh, you know, there's certainly a change circumstance uh, with regard to that. Um, the way I, my shorthand for, you know, stating the architect standard of care is what would a reasonably prudent peer a reasonably prudent architect to do in your circumstance. And whenever there's a judgment call in a design capacity, you know, what should you do from a professional capacity? I think that's the question that architects should be asking themselves is what would a reasonably, my reasonably prudent peer do in this situation? Um, so getting down to the next level of, you know, what happens when architects are delayed in the performance of their services, um, all of this is in context of the standard of care, but section 3.13 of the B101 uh, sets forth the architect's obligations to create a schedule for the performance of their services and then stick to it. Um, the one caveat to that stick to it is a sentence that we've highlighted and that I will, uh, I will read. Once approved by the owner, time limits established by the schedule shall not, except for reasonable cause, be exceeded by the architect or owner. So uh, if you're an architect and you have reasonable cause to, you know, delay your services because that zoning board won't meet, um, or so you can't get zoning approval because your job site is shut down, you can't go do a punch list, um, or because uh, there are, you know, some other kinds of reasonable cause due to the COVID-19 issues. Uh, there are some, you know, there definitely are some legal uh, arguments to be made um, with the standard of care language that we read before and uh, section 3.13 that those uh, that there is reasonable cause to be delayed or to alter your services in some uh, manner. Uh, the next one issue we've repeatedly gotten questions from architects for is about is, is what about evaluations of work? I'm supposed to do site visits periodically and I'm just in an area where I don't feel safe going out to a job site. And it's, at least in my opinion, very reasonable uh, concern at, at this time. Uh, the language that we were showing on the screen here right now is the standard B101 language for uh, that requires an architect to visit the pr uh, site at intervals appropriate to the stage of construction um, and to become generally familiar with the progress and quality of the port of the portion of the work completed and to determine in general if the work observed is being performed in a manner indicating that the work when fully completed will be in accordance with the contract documents. Again, this is a flexible standard as well. Um, I've always been, you know, took this to mean that you don't have to go out to the job site necessarily every two weeks or every month. It's a judgment call. And uh, and your standard of care is certainly going to come into play here. Um, but if, you know, there's site work being done and there's one trade on the site, uh, and then maybe it doesn't make sense to come out all that often. But once the project gets a little bit more humming along and you've got 10 trades on the site, it might make sense to come out, you know, once every two weeks or once a week, uh, depending, um, using your professional judgment. Now, um, this takes, there's a whole lot of things to take into context when, when thinking about the site out, site visit obligation and, um, COVID-19 and the kind of recommendations that we've seen from, CDC and states about social distancing and so on. Certainly, if your project is suspended and there's no work being done, it probably doesn't make it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to actually come out to the site because there's nothing going on. But what if there is still uh, work going on uh, on the site and you are being asked or or told to come out to the job site to you know, review pay applications or at least check out the status of the work um, in, re in regard to a pay application review or to even do something uh, a little bit more nuanced like like doing a punch list uh, substantial completion review, which is obviously going to be more in depth in your typical site visit. Um, some things to, first of all, all the stuff that we've talked about before with regard to standard of care um, and the scheduling um, language that we showed, I think gives you as an architect a a pretty good legal argument to make that there should be some accommodations uh, made for the fact that 
it might just simply be unsafe to come out to a job site right now. Um, what other uh, recommendation that we have um, come up with, um, Jimmy, can, I think you could talk uh, to a paper that the risk management committee at the AIA put together and some of their recommendations. But in general, you know, we're recommending that, you know, the architect, you know, communicate with, with the owner and contractor about the situations uh, that you're facing and the issues that you're facing and your concerns. Um, agree to the extent you can. Uh, agree to a solution that works for your project. It may not be as simple or as black and white as I'm either going to do my site visits as they typically were, you know, before this uh, pandemic arose, or I'm just simply not going to do them at all. It could, there could be a middle ground that would be a, um, that you could reach with the owner and the contractor. Uh, some of the options might include things like doing limited site visits, coming out a little bit less often, um, perhaps coming out instead of having three people with you, just come out by yourself. Um, you can even talk about protocols for social, uh, you know, social distancing while you're on the job site. Uh, these are all possibilities. You know, there's even the possibilities to uh, conduct a site visit during non-working hours. There's definitely some potential complications with that, um, uh, but but that's it is something that you could discuss with your owner and and talk with the contractor. It's also a possibility of doing virtual site visits. Um, I would caution folks who are, are thinking about that. Whatever agreement you come to, particularly if you're talking about not physically being present there, um, make sure you agree to not just the concepts, but to all of the little details. Um, if a contractor is going to be walking around the job site with a video camera, let's make sure we're, you know, very clear on what item, where, what areas we're seeing, um, you know, what's going to show up, you know, on the video camera. Like, are we, are we going into every single room? Are we doing a sampling of rooms? Just make sure you agree with those things with the owner. Uh, and when you agree with them, don't just shake hands. Well, certainly don't shake hands in this context, but don't just, you know, be okay with a head nod and, okay, that's what we're going to do. Make sure you put all of those specifics and whatever accommodations you've come to um, into a G802, um, an amendment to the owner architect agreement. We do offer a G802 uh, document that is a standard form amendment, but Obviously, it doesn't have to necessarily be on an AIA contract document. Just make sure you're amending the contract uh, and committing that into, you know, a, a writing that is very detailed and agreed by uh, both the owner and the uh, architect. Jimmy, I, I've um, I mentioned you a few minutes ago, and and I know you've been thinking about these issues uh, with our risk management committee, um, and you've got some insight from them. Do you have any other thoughts you want to add to this? Uh, sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I, I do work closely with the AIA's Risk Management Committee. Uh, it's a committee of architects and attorneys, uh, and some who are both at night. Uh, and they publish risk management uh, material that architects, uh, largely architects, can visit to learn how to manage the risk, obviously, uh, as the name suggests. They got together um, right when this uh, COVID-19 issue really started to, to snowball about two weeks ago and met for two days straight um, virtually. And what they came up with was a, what ended up being roughly 10, 11 page article that's on the AI website. And I, it's under the AI risk management page, but I think it's also just on AI.org. It's called Practice Considerations, How to Manage Your Firm's Risk in Response to COVID-19 or something very similar to that. And it is a, it's a pretty in-depth look at just some of the considerations. It's very few recommendations in terms of how to go with a specific approach, but it is just things to consider. So uh, architects might want to uh, utilize that resource, um, if for nothing else, as sort of a, a checkmark outline to make sure they're checking off the right things and it goes into, into detail and it says things like you know make sure you have a writing if you amend your contract like Mike just referenced it also talks about things like you know if you're forced to be out of your building which that's probably fewer and fewer firms as the days goes on but if you're forced to be out of your building in a very short period of time you, know, you have to make sure that all your HEPA filters have been changed that your air conditioning is set appropriately that you notify your building owner and the co-tenants like just things that you might not be thinking about because there is so much to think about right now. So rather than me say some things that I would consider in this situation, I would just point people to that resource and say that's that's a, a good place to start at least. Right. And yeah, thank you, Jimmy. I think that was an excellent, very timely article that that, that team put together. Um, and again, with, you know, 
I, I have to emphasize here with this issue, particularly with site visits, this is a very unique uh, situation that we find ourselves in, and and our contracts, you know, contracts in general, they they cannot, uh, you know, address every little scenario uh, that might possibly pop up. They'd be literally thousands of pages long, and they would they wouldn't even come close to getting to all of the possibilities. And we don't have right now, you know, a lot of precedent for this. And I think we're developing that precedent as we go as attorneys and practitioners. Um, but it's not like we can look back to, all right, there was a pandemic in like. 1960 or 1970 where we've got a case that, that kind of tells us you know what we're supposed to do here um so i mean i think you know of course the last pandemic was in the early 1900s um so so yeah i think we are or we are definitely having to do a little bit of um um kind of working and, and just being reasonable as, as much as we can um and i do think that the, the b101 gives you some pretty good legal arguments for you know, accommodating and, and on a job site visit, that, those kinds of things. And Mike, and, one, one thing I'd say before, yes, before you go on to the next slide, if I may, and that is one thing for architects to understand with, to understand with respect to the standard of care is, and you touched on this earlier, and that's the standard of care is always backward looking, right? So there is, there is nothing that says like, I can't publish something that says this is the standard of care in this situation, mainly because there is no precedent for this. But also, even if there were, standard of care is by definition backwards looking. So two years from now, three years from now, 10 years from now, someone will be able to go back and say, well, in that situation, it seems as though the standard of care would have been met if an architect firm did X, Y, and Z. So right now, architecture firms across the country are setting the standard of care by how they are acting and how they are reacting to this situation. So if every architecture firm in America decides they're doing site visits virtually, it'd be very difficult for somebody to argue, I think, 10 years from now or five years from now that our architecture firm did their site visits virtually and that breached the standard of care, for example, because every architecture firm certainly within their locality and perhaps even nationwide moved to that practice that pattern of practice in this situation so it's it's a little bit of a nuance but i wanted to, to touch on that i had that, that thought as you were thinking sorry i'll, I'll let you go slide thanks for indulging you're right yeah you know you're, you're absolutely right it, you know the standard of care like i said before is circumstance uh specific and right now architects all over the country are asking themselves is it safe to go to a job site um and and the answer to that question is you know it, it kind of depends on where you are if i'm an a architect in new york city and i see what's going on there and the um i ride the subway to get to my job site you know you got to ask yourself what would my reasonably prudent peer do would they stay at home and and uh and follow you know uh, advice that you know folks have, have been hearing for, from officials in that state to stay home unless it's an absolute necessity. I think there's a pretty good argument for that, particularly if architects in that city and in that those similar situations are doing just that. Um, there, there's a there's a pretty good argument. We just can't say for certain because um, you know things are evolving quickly and uh, and there's not a lot of precedent for this kind of activity and kind of uh, these kinds of issues. So very Thank good you. points. I pr appreciate you jumping in there. Um, Okay, so let's talk about, uh, we're getting kind of towards the end of things here, but we'll talk about additional services uh, next. If you're an architect um, at any time, uh, it's very likely that you might be asked by an owner, even inadvertently, to do work that is beyond uh, what you have been contracted to do. Um, you know, it's, it's not at all uncommon for an architect to be asked to do, you know, do five different designs of my home layout and you've only agreed in your B101 agreement to do one design. Um, certainly, the, that is going to continue and, and probably be even worse uh, given uh, the COVID-19 issues that we're, we're all facing. Uh, and really when it comes to doing, when it comes to issues of additional services and if you've been asked to do additional work, uh, Article 4 of B101 is your playbook. Uh, it's a, it's a, a couple of pages of that document that you should be very familiar with as an architect, um, or else you're going to do a lot of work for free. Um, so, frankly, so, be, so some of the things that you might run into as an architect, if uh, as owners are rethinking their projects a little bit, um, they might lower their budgets. 
and they might lower the scope of the work. You know, instead of doing a 500,000 square foot building, they might think, well, maybe 350,000 is gonna um, is all that we need now. So, if you're being asked, for example, to uh, to adjust your drawings and specifications to take into account um, things that have changed, like scope, price, budget, those kinds of things, uh, then B101 does have an avenue for you to. Uh, to request additional services and compensation for that. So just um, for example, uh, if you were to run into an issue like a material change in the project, which is listed in section 4.2.1.1, that does entitle you to an additional service and compensation, you need to first notify the owner uh, with reasonable promptness and explain the facts and circumstances giving rise to the need. So you know, you, the budget has been decreased by $200,000 or $150,000. I need to adjust, you know, the materials and some of the, you know, some of the other components of the drawings and specifications to accommodate that. Uh, therefore, you know, under 4.2.1.1, I believe I'm entitled to additional compensation. You know, something like that. Explain what, what, what it is, that, why you're asking for additional compensation. And then make sure you get the owner's written authorization before uh, going forward and doing those kinds of, of activities. Um, if you want to, there is a document that we created specifically for these um, situations. G801 is an amendment, or it's actually an, it's styled as a notice for additional services, but it gives notice and then it requests uh, the owner's uh, written authorization. Um, another thing that could entitle you to additional services uh, is uh, listed in section, subsection point two of this language here, it says services necessitated by the enactment or revision of codes, laws, or regulations, including changing or editing previously prepared instruments of service. So, if um, you know there have been a number of executive orders, things that are you know technically have the force of law, um, if they if those executive orders, those laws have in some way require you to adjust your drawings and specifications or adjust your services in some sort, uh, you might be entitled to additional compensation under, um, under that subsection as well. So Jimmy, I think this is the point where we've only got a handful of slides left and sorry folks again that we're going over, but I'm going to pass it off to you, Jimmy, to talk about owner suspensions and the implication that might have for, uh, for architects. Sure. So um, owners, as a result of COVID-19, owners are going to be forced to suspend projects. So in this situation, what's what's the architect entitled to? What are their options? If you look at the two provisions on your screen, you're looking at 9.2 and 9.3, and these are of the B101 document. Under section 9.2, the architect is compensated for costs associated with the suspension. So in this scenario, the architect's compensated for work performed as well as the expenses incurred in the interruption and resumption of the architect's services. So these are things that you typically think of as like demobilization and remobilization type costs. Under 9.3, architects are given the right to terminate their agreement if the owner suspends the project for more than 90 cumulative days. Um, and you'll notice that the wording is different than the contractor right that we referenced earlier in that it's cumulative it's not consecutive uh, under the terms of 9.3 notice under all of these notice um, you should notice that notice is still required if you look to sections 9.5 and 9.6 so then what happens if an owner just terminates the contract for convenience we're not talking about suspension what's the what's the procedure what's the architect entitled to uh, is there a termination fee, a licensing fee, et cetera? Well, 9.5, 9.6, and 9.7 answer these questions. So if you look to 9.5, an, an owner can terminate the architect's agreement for convenience at any time for any reason, as long as the owner gives seven days notice. If the owner terminates for convenience, then it's responsible, however, for paying the architect certain costs, and those costs are set forth in sections 9.6 and 9.7. So the costs um, specifically listed in 9.6 are the ones that you're reading there on your screen. And those are services performed, costs attributable to the termination, um, reimbursable expenses, which is capitalized. And uh, as you probably know, any term that's capitalized uh, is a term of art and it's a defined term. So reimbursable expenses is defined in this agreement. Uh, and 
the costs attributable to the architect's termination of the consultant agreements. And that's similar to the contractor's right to receive reimbursement for the costs attributable to the contractor terminating its subcontracts. And that's because it's required that the owner, the if the owner terminates its contract for convenience, be it with a contractor or an architect, that party, the contractor and the architect, have an obligation to turn around and in turn terminate all of their subcontracts, consultant agreements, et cetera. So they are reimbursed under the AIA framework for having to do so. The next section I referenced earlier was section 9.7. Uh, section 9.7 uh, specifies a termination fee and a licensing fee. And the termination fee, uh, Mike sort of explained that earlier with respect to the uh, termination of the contractor agreement. And that's um, a fee that the parties can agree to beforehand. That just sets forth a fee that the owner pays in the event that it terminates the agreement for convenience. A licensing fee is unique to the architect because the licensing fee essentially reimburses and pays the architect for its instruments of service in the event that the owner wants to continue to utilize those instruments of service in the project. So it essentially licenses the rights to utilize those IOS instruments of service in the future for that project, just likely with a different architect. So tying this into the subconsultant agreements, again, we referenced the uh, flow down provision earlier with respect to subcontractors when we were talking about owner contractor. The subconsultant flow down provision works very similarly. So if you're a subconsultant uh, on this call and you're wondering, you know, how does all this apply to me? You want to look to your C401 Article 1.3, and that's your flow down provision. And how this works is again the terms of the owner architect prime contract flow down into your subcontract your subconsultant agreement um, in to, to one extent or another so you want to be familiar with this uh, article and the terms of the prime contract because they might flow down into your contracts so you want to pay attention to the prime agreement uh, provisions relating to notice relating to claims uh, additional services and things like that because you might have rights and responsibilities flowing down from that agreement uh, both uh, Mike and I have referenced throughout this presentation various modifications uh, or amendments that you can make. Uh, so, for example, uh, I researched this question last week, um, and it was interesting. Um, we're, we've been talking about the A201. The A201 is incorporated by reference into the A101. Well, a lot of people, um, contractors, for example, might utilize the A104 or the A105. Well, those are essentially shorter versions. A104 is a little bit longer than your A105, which is the, the shortest, um, most abbreviated agreement, owner contractor agreement that the AI publishes. And they have been abbreviated by removing certain clauses, just making them shorter um, in the expectation that those clauses might be lesser utilized than, it, than you might need in a more robust, complex, complicated project. But one of the terms that was taken out to make the A104 abbreviated was the suspension provision. So there is no right, automatic right of suspension uh, and triggering results in the A104 and the A105 like there is in the A101 and the A201. So um, one of the ways to remedy that in this type of situation is to modify your contract. And you can add in terms after the fact utilizing one of these modification um, forms and that's how you would go about doing that. So if you're if you're a, an architect or a contractor and utilizing an A104 and A105 and you say, well, our owner wants to suspend, how do they do that? Well, this would be one way to do it. You would utilize one of these modification forms, you draft up some language, you incorporate it in, and then it becomes part of your agreement. And these the, the G802, G803, G701, and G701S are some of the forms that the AIA um, publishes that you can use for those purposes. I think um, we have one more topic. Yeah, so um, the last topic we're gonna talk about here is insurance. Um, so we are not gonna get into depth on insurance issues. Um, and the reason why is because of uh, the disclaimer that we have to give, which is we, we are not insurance experts. 
Um, for that, we would defer to insurance professionals, insurance counsel, insurance representatives. But what we want to do here is just give everybody a couple things to consider, some insurance issues they can consider when reacting to COVID-19 types of issues. So the first thing to understand is that force majeure, that that term, means something different in the insurance context. We've already talked about what it means in the contract context, and we've sort of been talking about it in theory, at least this whole time. In the insurance context, it can either um, trigger insurance coverage or trigger a denial of insurance coverage, depending upon how your insurance policy is worded. Um, so one of the, you know, all of the AIA agreements, the vast majority of them, require the parties to obtain insurance to some level or another. So if you're looking at the A101 uh, and the A201, the A101 has an entire exhibit, Exhibit A, which is entitled Insurance and Bonds. And that document goes through a very thorough list of all of the insurance options that are available to parties, and they can kind of check off which ones they want. Some of the more common ones that you might be familiar with is like builder's risk, for example, which is a form of property insurance. Um, there's another one in there entitled loss of use, business interruption and delay in completion insurance. And usually kind of referred to together as business interruption insurance. Well, business interruption insurance might sound like a very intriguing option right now if you have it, but you should understand that Business interruption insurance may not provide coverage even if your business has been interrupted by COVID-19, and here's why. Most insurance related to construction is in one form or another property insurance, so builder's risk insurance or you know, completed operations, property damage insurance. There needs to be some sort of property damage, physical property damage for that policy to respond to. So something has to have been physically damaged. Business interruption insurance, the policy wording and the exclusions are usually worded in a similar manner, where there needs to have been physical property damage that triggered the business interruption for that policy to come into play. So because it's sort of a type of property insurance, it may not, again, may not come into play for COVID-19 issues. So here's just a quick example. If you run uh, an architecture firm and you're in a, you know, maybe a five-story building and you're on the second floor and you had to evacuate, now everybody works from home because you're quarantined or you're social distancing. Well, if there's no property damage to your building, your business interruption insurance may not come into play. If you're on the second floor of that building, however, and the tenant on the third floor had a water leak, irrespective of COVID-19 or not, and you had to go quarantine and work from home and, and get out of your building as a result of that property damage, the water, then your business interruption insurance might cover some of those expenses. So all of this is to say that insurance issues are very dependent on how your policies are worded and which policies you have. So your policy wording and at the end of the day, you want to check with your insurance counsel to see if you have if you or your company has any insurance products, any policy potentially cover any damages uh, or any money that you've lost, income that you've lost as a result of COVID related issues. So check with counsel, check with your insurance professional, your insurance advisor, uh, and see if there are any options out there. Uh, and with that, Mike, I'll turn it back over to you to kind of wrap it up. Excellent. Um, so we've been answering, thank you, Jimmy. That was, that was really good. And we uh, have been answering questions throughout and we're almost at, uh, at the two hour mark. So for those of you who have stuck with us, thank you very much. Um, we originally conceived of this idea of a webinar as being 30 minutes um, about a week ago. And now we, here we are at two hours of talking and there's just a lot, you know, there's, there's just a lot of issues going on and, uh, and we may end up uh, providing more materials and stuff like that. Like, along these lines here over the next few months as things develop further. Um, so I'm not going to actually ask any more questions right now because we're getting uh, pretty long here already. Um, I will tell you, though, that we have a number of resources uh, on our website. Um, if you want to get on there, it's AIAcontracts.org. Uh, and uh, we have a service uh, uh, 
called Doc Info. You can write us uh, and ask us questions, or you can call us. We'll, we'll answer questions related to AIA contract documents. Again, can't provide legal advice, um, but we can certainly help you out with the kind of questions and topics that we've been talking about right now. So for those of you who have stayed on um, for this entire webinar, and we really appreciate it, uh, thank you very much. And I think we'll go ahead and close out. Take care. Thank you. Bye.